As people start to enter the webinar, um, welcome to the third panel of Expanding Empathy 2023 uh, here at Penn State. Um, today we have um, a really exciting panel on moral and social learning. Um, so just waiting a second for more people to trickle in. So yeah, so um, this is the third panel of the Expanding Empathy series uh, hosted through the Rock Ethics Institute at Penn State um, as part of the Moral Agency and Moral Development Initiative uh, with a focus on moral psychology. Um, the series is also supported by the psychology department and the philosophy department here at Penn State. And so we thank them for their support. So as with the first two panels, uh, the main format is such that we want to have these interdisciplinary conversations between philosophy and psychology. And so we've had each of two speakers come in and give talks on a kind of a common theme. And then we'll have uh, time for a few questions after each talk, but then we wanna also make sure to set aside some time at the end for uh, conversation with the group, um, some back and forth dialogue. Um, if you have questions, uh, please make sure to use the Q&A function that's there at the bottom of the Zoom window. Uh, the Q&A, uh, others will be able to see your questions, so just FYI, uh, but uh, attendees aren't able to like say the questions. It's, it's just, you just type the questions in there, then I'll uh, speak them out loud to the uh, speakers who I will introduce. So let me introduce the speakers we have with us today. So we're gonna start off with a talk by uh, Oriel Feldman Hall who is an associate professor with tenure at Brown University. Um, so Oriol um, does a lot of fascinating work in social and decision neuroscience, uh, focusing on morality, altruism, social emotional decision-making, um, looking at competing pressures, including things like harm, fairness, self-interest, and concern for others. Um, also looking at how the brain detects values and assesses these different kinds of reward and punishment contingencies and how emotions play a role in social interactions. Uh, Dr. Feldman Hall has received a variety of early career awards, including from uh, the American Psychological Association, the Association for Psychological Science, the Society for Social Neuroscience, and the Society for Neuroeconomics, among others, um, and received grants from prominent organizations like the National Science Foundation. Um, we are also joined by philosopher Victor Kumar, who's an assistant professor of philosophy at Boston University, where he runs the Interdisciplinary Mind and Morality Lab. Um, Dr. Kumar works on science and ethics, is interested in cognitive science, evolutionary theory, and how these fields uh, can change our understanding of individuals and societies. Um, he also teaches and speaks about feminism, philosophy of race, and social justice. And just this past year, uh, he released a book with Richmond Campbell called A Better Ape, um, and was also co-editor of a, a book called The Moral Psychology of Disgust. So it's wonderful to have both of you here with us today. I'm looking forward to both of your talks. And again, if you have any questions during the talks, please just drop them in the Q&A. And even if we can't get to them during, we will make sure to get to them either afterwards or in the longer form discussion at the end. So uh, whenever you're ready, Aura. Awesome. Thank you so much, Daryl. I'm so excited to be here and to be chatting about some of my research, um, which is on how emotion influences social learning. And in particular, I'm excited to be talking about these ideas in the context of philosophy. Um, so let me go ahead and share my screen. Does that look good on your end? Okay, awesome. So, um, I already said this to Daryl, but I'm happy for to be interrupted, if, especially if it's a clarifying question. I always hate when I have a burning question um, to wait till the end of a talk. I usually forget it. So feel free to interrupt or you know drop it in the Q and A, and I'll do my best to to answer it um, uh, during this uh, this talk. Okay. So how does emotion influence social learning? Well. Let's consider our social worlds. They are enormously vast. There are thousands of people that we might encounter in any given day. And we can learn both about these people and from these people as well. So let's take a particular example. We might have a social interaction. Um, so for example, I might have a juicy secret or a piece of gossip that I wanna share with someone but I don't know who I should share it with. 
if I don't want it to get back to the person it is about. So if I tell someone a piece of the juicy gossip, they might go and tell someone else who might tell someone else, and it might get back to the person who I'm actually speaking about. So how do we figure out whether to share a piece of gossip with someone when we don't really know what their intentions are, what they're thinking, who they might be connected to within our vast uh, network? We do this really well, actually. So we have this spectacular feat of figuring out what to do um, and how to learn about other people. And one of the things that my lab is interested in is understanding how we do this. So one of the most uh, dominant accounts is in the non-social domain. It's taken from this idea that all learning, all decision-making models operate on something called reward. And one of the most elegant examples of how reward functions to support learning is through this idea of a prediction error. So if you expect reward at, let's say, a certain time point or after a certain action, but it fails to occur, you have what is called this negative prediction error because the expectation that you are going to get that reward is violated. And when expectations about rewards are violated, we can essentially titrate our expectations to become more in line with what the environment has to offer us and therefore alter our behavior accordingly. And this model, which was um, uh, first shown in 1987 by Schultz and colleagues, has been shown time and time again. It's across species. It happens um, from you know, mice to men and everything in between. And this dominant model of human learning has also been co-opted by the social domain, um, by social neuroscientists, by social psychologists, to explain how people learn about and from other people. But if we actually assess um, the literature over the past, let's say 10 to 15 years, there's not that many studies that show that these reward prediction errors govern social learning. And this suggests that these prediction errors may not be doing such a comprehensive job of helping us learn about our social world. So why might that be? Well, we have recently highlighted some of the shortcomings of these standard learning frameworks for understanding how people make social decisions. So social learning in general and social decision making is an inference problem. And the assumptions that we typically make in these off-the-shelf models in the non-social domain, like I just told you about, you know, such as, let's say, formalizing how we gamble with slot machines or bandits, it might work really well when we, talk, when we think about reward, but it leads to faulty inferences in the social world, in large part because the complexity of the social space is larger, it's more uncertain, and there are far more unobservable latent states or properties that are all interacting with one another. Um, so for example, um, one of the main issues is that a social outcome, unlike in a slot machine scenario where you get a reward and it's just positive, a social outcome could be interpreted as, as positive in one situation, but negative in another. And this is problematic in the social space that we're trying to formalize how um, people learn and make decisions in this, in, uh, when it comes to other people. Um, and I want to suggest that there might be another parameter, another construct um, that does a really good job of helping us figure out how we learn about the world. So if we move out of this learning literature just for a moment and we think about decision-making in general, the idea that valence or even emotion more broadly contributes how we make decisions, it's not a new idea. So we know from decades of work um, that uh, emotion influences our choices. And there are, not, there are a number of different theories that argue for a very specific mapping between a certain emotion and a certain action tendency. So for example, there's this idea that fear leads to avoidance or that anger might lead to punishment. And these are very common assumptions within the field. Okay, so there's this idea that a specific emotion leads, leads to a discrete action tendency. The problem is, is that how our field has measured emotions while people make decisions is slightly problematic. So first of all, it's really difficult to measure these nebulous emotional ex experiences. And there are limitations to the host of measurements that we typically employ. 
So for example, we create mood inductions, which try to evoke this similar emotional reaction um, in all of our participants. We can also ask um, self-report measures. So for example, how angry are you feeling? Um, the problem with asking something like that is that it imposes an emotional structure. It assumes that everybody ought to be feeling anger in a given situation. Um, and we can also use something called physiological measures, like, you know, skin conductance response. But one of the problems with that is that we have to infer that there's a, a certain emotional experience, experience coming from how much our hand is sweating. So with all these measurements, there's limitations to how well we can argue that emotion is actually biasing, directing, or influencing the types of decisions um, that we make. So what kind of solution um, might we have? So in all the work that I'm going to be talking about today, um, it is led by one of my former graduate students of uh, Joseph Hefner, who is uh, now at Yale University doing his postdoc. Um, so what we wanted to do is we wanted to create a measurement that would overcome some of the common issues that the field has suffered from. But one that was also very quick to implement within a decision making or learning framework. And so what we did is we co-opted a model of emotion um, that has been identified along two dimensions. And this is a very common, um, well-used idea um, dating back all the way to the 80s. And it's called core affect. So on the one hand, we have something called valence, which is something from positive, like happy, to negative or unhappy. And we also have another dimension, arousal, which is something like um, uh, highly alert, uh, versus sleepy or quiet or calm. And these two dimensions of affect or emotion have shown to be um, embodied as well. So there's a neurobiological basis, um, not only in the body, but in the brain that suggests that it might, might be two dimensional in this way. And there's a, and there's a lot of uh, behavioral data as well that suggests this uh, two dimensional solution. So we took, um, inspired by this very basic and uh, useful grid, what we did is we created a very fine grain, 500 by 500 pixelated grid, where we can have our participants essentially simultaneously rate their effective experiences using this circumflex like map, and we can embed it into a decision uh, making task. Okay. So I'm going to tell you about a series of studies uh, in a decision-making context, and then I'm going to show how we think about using these tools in a learning context. So in one of the first things that we did, we had our um, subjects complete an emotion classification task. And what they had to do was to rate various emotion words within this affect uh, grid space. So they might see these words like afraid, angry, quiet, neutral, peppy, and they simply had to place these words within um, the circumflex. We then had our subjects play an economic game. In this particular um, uh, experiment that I'm gonna tell you about, we had our subjects play an ultimatum game. What is the ultimatum game? Um, it looks at what types of decisions happen after um, someone has been treated unfairly. So the task is very simple. There are two players. Let's say there's Dylan and you, the subject. Dylan might be given $10 and decides to split the money however he sees fit with you, the subject. Um, if he decides to split it on a one, giving you $1, keeping nine for himself, um, you then have the option to either reject um, that uh, split, in which case neither of you would get any money. So that's a punitive decision. Or you can accept the offer as is, keeping the $1 or the $2, um, whatever Dylan has decided, and Dylan uh, keeps the other side, in this case, the $9. Now, critically in this um, ultimatum game, what we did is we embedded our circumflex measure, our affect grid, and we asked our subjects how, you, how they felt after receiving an unfair offer, such as a 2080 split um, from Dylan. Okay, so um, just looking at the um, emotion classification task, irrespective of the ultimatum task, what did we find? So we've run this um, uh, study a number of times, as you will see, here are data points across 
um, 1,000, almost 500 people um, in three different studies. And what I'm showing you here is valence along the X and arousal along the Y. And where those lines are demarcate, demarcating these neutral points for both dimensions. But the second thing I wanna point out is that there's these um, natural mappings along uh, the diagonals, much, much like what I showed you previously using the circumflex. And you can see exactly where these different emotions, including um, the error bars that surround them in which all of these different emotions fall, like calm versus afraid, angry, aroused, and surprised uh, for all our different um, uh, 20 emotions that we ask people to classify. So this makes this measurement is ideal essentially for training something like a classifier um, to identify what types of emotion states an individual um, would do. Okay. So we have these two data sets, right? So we have the data from this ultimatum, ultimatum game where we ask people to rate how they were feeling when um, somebody uh, gave them an unfair offer. We had this on every single trial um, that a participant played in the ultimate, ultimatum game. And we also know what decision they ultimately decided to do, whether they decided to punish the person, Dylan, let's say, for making an unfair offer or to accept Dylan's um, unfair offer. And so naturally the question is, how do we characterize um, how can we essentially characterize these unlabeled emotional experiences, which is what you're seeing here. So the accept decision, these accept decisions um, operate here in the circumplex, whereas the punishment decisions operate here. Um, using the labeled emotion ratings from our emotion classification task. So essentially what we wanna do is we wanna take these, um, the data that we have in the emotion classification task where people took um, the word like anger and they placed it here or aroused or surprised and placed it here. And we wanna use this data to understand which emotions people were feeling in the ultimatum game when they were choosing to accept the offer or to punish Dylan for making an unfair offer. And to do that, we essentially built a cross-validated model, which learns the associations between valence and arousal ratings to predict the appropriate emotion class. And then we apply this model to the unlabeled data, data in the ultimatum game. Okay, so essentially we used a series of machine learning approaches to let our data-driven framework essentially reveal the nature of this relationship. Um, I don't, won't go into the details um, for this particular talk, um, but we use both supervised and unsupervised uh, machine learning algorithms, including a neural network and a k-nearest neighbor, both of which did the best um, as opposed to our support vector machine. And all of our models, all three of these models were trained on the emotion classification data. And what you can see is that they did actually a pretty good job of predicting which emotion is being felt in the ultimatum game. So this is a 20 way classification problem. It's a really hard problem to do. So chance is 5%. And you can, say, you can see that the neural network and the K nearest neighbors do far better than chance um, when figuring, what, figuring out what, per, uh, what feeling a person um, is having during the ultimatum game. Okay, so let's look at what we found. So on the y-axis here, I'm going to reveal the emotion list given the model likelihood on the x-axis for decisions to accept and decisions to punish separately, okay? Now, just to remind you that um, what this um, uh, x-axis is looking at is the model likelihoods that each data point is assigned a probability for one of the 20 emotion classes, which is essentially averaged within and then between all of our um, subjects. So let's look at the emotions that people are feeling when they accept um, an offer from another individual. So you can see that the most predominant emotion that people are feeling is satisfied, followed by happy and then peppy. So that makes sense. Now, what happens with punishment? So the predominant idea in the literature is that 
anger leads to punishment. So we can test whether that is in fact true in a far more agnostic without these experimental um, or excuse me, experimenter demands. So what do we see? What we see is that sad, disappointed, and disgusted are the top three emotions felt um, when deciding to punish someone for treating them unfairly. And really, anger only comes in about fifth in this particular um, experiment. So this is really interesting, right? So we take the data-driven approach, and we find that when the experimenter is agnostic, for what the person ought to feel. So we're not saying on a scale from one to 10, how angry are you feeling? We're just saying, tell us along these two dimensions where your emotion falls. What we find is that anger is not actually very predictive of decisions to punish at all. What is far more predictive are um, things like sadness and disappointment. Okay, <clears throat> now we took this task to a number of other different test beds, not just the ultimatum game, but also things like the prisoner's dilemma and the public goods game. And our question was the same, where does anger rank as a predictive emotion for governing these competitive or cooperative um, decisions? Uh, in a public goods game where you're playing with three other people with a prisoner's dilemma, you're choosing to cooperate or defect with one other individual. And what we found is that actually anger ranks pretty low when it comes to these um, negative competitive decisions with other people. It's either ranking ninth in a prisoner's dilemma game or ranking eighth in a public goods game. The, the emotion that consistently ranked high was again, disappointment and sadness. Okay. So in this first half of the talk, I showed you that one way we can sidestep some of the issues that abound when we're studying how emotions influence choice is by removing essentially our own experimental bias of what we think a person ought to feel and look at the data, apply a machine classifier algorithm to suss out what exactly people are uh, feeling in this unlabeled space. And what we can see is that this predominant idea that something like anger might be motivating these competitive punitive decisions is not actually the types of emotions that we're feeling when we are um, responding to norm violations. Okay, so with these new methods and these different emotions, we can get a better understanding of how certain emotions um, impact and influence choice. But what about rewarding? So I wanna return for a moment to this idea that um, we use prediction errors to update what we know about the world. And in this framework, reward is the primary driver of how we learn about everything in the world. Right? So we have a reward that's out there. It might be money, it might be juice, it might be social value in some way, like trustworthiness. Um, and if we have a certain expectation about how someone might behave, a violation of that, of that expectation along a rewarding dimension tells us how we need to update our behavior accordingly. But the argument I want to put forward today is that we can actually take some of the tools that I was just talking to you about and use this idea that emotion might be an equally powerful, if not more powerful construct to, to guide how we update our knowledge about the world. Okay, so given the success of the prediction error account, um, we essentially borrowed from this framework, which allowed us to assess whether emotion provides this useful learning signal during choice that extends beyond reward in particular. And let me illustrate this with a toy example. So let's say that you avoid collaborating um, with a certain colleague because you dread their interactions with him. He's aloof, he's grumpy, um, he's not a particular joy to be around. But what happens is you do have to collaborate ultimately. You have to write this grant with this individual. And once you start collaborating with him, you discover that he's actually quite warm and humorous. Um, in this collaborative sense. And the unexpected joy of working with this colleague produces this positive emotion prediction error, which would essentially motivate more extensive, extensive future collaborations. Um, so this is again work um, done by Joey um, Hefner, and he figured out using this circumflex, um, this pixelated grid, a very clever way to measure emotion prediction errors. 
So essentially he marries this pixelated grid with any series of um, economic games. So let me use the, um, the ultimatum game again. Um, in this case, you don't just say, what emotion are you feeling? But you're also asked to predict what type of emotion you will feel. So let's say you're playing the ultimatum game. You um, are asked to make a reward prediction. How much do you think that Dylan's actually going to give you in this particular case? If he does give you that, how will you feel? So that's your emotion prediction. Now you see what Dylan gives you and you're asked to again say how you feel given this new information, how much Dylan ultimately offered to you. And then we ask you to make a decision to either accept the offer or to reject. And one of the beautiful things about this paradigm, this configuration allows us to, comfort, um, excuse me, to compute two forms of emotion prediction errors an arousal prediction error and a valence prediction error. And we can do, do this alongside a reward prediction error. So this is again borrowing directly from the logic and reinforcement learning, which simply operationalizes prediction errors by the distance between the expectation of the reward and the actual um, reward received. So in this grid space, what would happen is if you started out here saying, I expect to feel this way, and you end up here saying, I actually feel this way, we can compute in this X, Y coordinate space, the coordinates where you said you were going to feel a certain way and where you actually feel. And we do this along a valence and arousal dimension. Okay. Now, what we can do is we can take these three different prediction errors, our two emotion prediction errors plus a reward prediction error, and we can see which one of these prediction errors is most likely to predict decisions in games um, like the ultimatum game or any other sort of game. Now, one of the benefits of computing emotion prediction errors in this way is it allows us to precisely compute um, prediction errors for two different emotion dimensions. Um, so we can very mathematically have a tractable idea of how much people's expectation diverges from their actual experience. Again, this does not rely on discrete specific emotions such as guilt or regret. So we're not asking people how guilty are you about to feel and then how guilty are you feeling? And we can essentially test whether these prediction errors bias social decisions um, in a more or less predictive way than the four prediction errors, which is the dominant count. Okay, so what did we find? Um, which one of these prediction errors was the best at predicting decisions to punish in the ultimatum game? So I'm um, plotting here the probability of rejecting in the ultimatum game as a function of each one of these different types of prediction errors. So negative values reflect negative prediction errors. So that would be less reward, less pleasantness, uh, less arousal than you expect. Um, and over here would be the positive prediction. So um, first, if we look at arousal, what we find is that the more arousal than you expect leads to greater punishment, okay? The second is less pleasantness than expected also leads to greater punishment. And finally, if we compare this critically to reward, what we find is less reward than expected also leads to greater punishment. Now, when we submit these three uh, regression betas to a coefficient test, what do we find? We find that valence prediction errors do significantly better at predicting decisions to punish than either the reward, which is here in green, or the arousal, which is here in red. Um, so while people do rely on reward predictions to inform their choices, they rely even more on negative deviations um, from expected emotional valence. Now, we also ran other studies exploring this effect in different um, tasks, um, all with slightly different constraints and different psychological questions. But this similar um, pattern of negative valence uh, prediction errors guiding decisions to punish hold throughout. So there's two takeaways from this data. The first is that we find a unique contribution of reward and emotion PEs. So there's not just that reward, it's not just that emotion is telling a story, it's that both reward and emotion are operating here. But the critical thing is that the valence prediction error was the strongest prediction 
um, or to motivate decisions to punish um, or to um, reverse or to punish in a different type of task, the justice game. Okay. So these data suggest um, a particularly privileged, privileged role for violations of emotional expectations and guiding behavior um, during these types of social interactions. Um, they also have important implications for mood disorders, such as depression. And the reason for that is that things like depression and anxiety are often characterized by impairments in both reward and emotion processing. And to date, it's been really unclear which one of these signals, is it emotion or is it reward, is the primary contributor to socially maladaptive behaviors, such as anhedonia, which you see in depression. So we wanted to test the strength of our, our different prediction errors um, in these two different groups, in a healthy group, um, and those with depression. Now, when we compare these two groups side by side, individuals with depression use reward prediction errors to the same exact degree as healthy controls. There was no significant difference between the two of them <clears throat> um, when it came to reward prediction errors. When we look at arousal, arousal prediction errors, what we find is that while healthy individuals see, uh, show this common, uh, show this same pattern that I showed you in the last data set, those who were, who were clinically depressed don't use arousal predictions at all. And when we look at valence uh, prediction errors, we see a much attenuated response in those with depression as compared um, to our depressed um, group. So in short, depression is associated with these intact reward prediction errors, but impaired, impaired emotion prediction errors. Okay, so why might this be? So we also had this group of subjects fill out our emotion classification task. And we simply asked them, just like we did before, to place all of these 20 different emotions inside of the circumflex. And one thing that we wanted to see is whether the granularity of emotional expression or feeling might be different between our two groups. So um, in the previous work, just to remind you, this is what uh, the aggregated data looked like across, um, in this particular case, 364 subjects. But when we break out our data along healthy and clinically depressed lines, what we find is a constriction in those with clinical depression. So I'm, um, I have a circumflex that shows you the breadth of um, how uh, people are rating their emotions if they're a healthy control compared to a constriction if they're in the clinically depressed group. So you can see that all these different 20 emotions hover closer to this neutral area compared to the healthy controls. And this is a significant difference um, between these two individuals. So this suggests that perhaps the reason that there's this impaired emotional prediction error, both at arousal and on balance between our clinically depressed group and those that were healthy might be because of this constricted emotional response. They feel anger as less um, valenced and less aroused than the healthy controls. They feel less happy than um, the clinical, the depressed population feels less happy compared to our healthy controls and so on and so forth. Okay, so all in all, um, to sum up here, um, I wanna make the argument today that emotion uh, serves as a really good learning signal for what is happening in the world. So we found, or we constructed, mostly Joey Hefner constructed this um, tool, which allows us an incredible amount of flexibility in how we study emotion in both decision-making and learning contexts. So we can take it and marry it with machine learning to examine which emotions, independent of any um, experimenter demands, influence social choices, and we can essentially debunk some of the common theories that anger, for example, leads to these choices to punish other people. We can use these tools to look at prediction errors, in particular emotion prediction errors, and how they weigh up against reward prediction errors in motivating um, a whole host of different social choices. Um, and we can even test it in the clinical domain to find that emotion appears to be 
the dominant um, uh, construct that is impaired in those uh, with depression. And future work will be looking at this and anxiety as well. Um, so thank you to everyone in listening, but in particular to my lab and to Joey for doing all this amazing work in my feminine bodies for making the work possible. Great, thank you. That was a fascinating talk. Um, if anybody has any questions, uh, please feel free to use the Q&A function here at the bottom of Zoom. Just drop your questions in. Um, yeah. Um, if, so yeah, if you have questions, others will see them, and uh, but I'll try to read them aloud uh, on your behalf. So I guess while we're waiting for any questions in the audience, um, if you have any thoughts, uh, Victor, of course, feel free to, to chime in. Um, one, you know, one question that I thought was one one question I had in terms of the emotion classifier and how you're thinking about like the role of something like anger mattering or not mattering as much for punishment decisions. So thinking about some of the some of the theories of emotion that you are re like referring to, like Lisa Plum Barrett and others, where there is the focus on different underlying dimensions of affect like valence and arousal, but also the role of conceptualization within specific contexts. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, for example, you know, the the anger that one might feel like in a boardroom setting versus like, you know, a physical altercation or something, thinking about how anger might be conceptualized differently within those different contexts. I'm just curious if you could say more about how you're thinking about the role of concepts and how those can be used to construct different forms of anger across mm. contexts and how, how that might factor into some of what you're thinking in terms of anger. Yeah, I mean, that's a really interesting question. So I think you're touching on two things. One, that the context in which the emotion might be felt might drive which emotion ultimately is felt, right? So like, I assume you mean like if you're in a board meeting versus, you know, at home with your spouse or your children or whatever it might be, the contextual framework in which that emotion arises will influence not only the degree to which you feel that emotion, but also the actions that you might take. And there are, you know, different emotion theories, you know, like with Lisa Thelman Barrett discussing that that information is really important, right? In the construction of which emotion you ultimately feel. Um, now, one of the things that's interesting about that is that when we look at, we use economic games a lot, like with the ultimatum game or the prisoner's dilemma or, or whatever. And independent of the contextual framing of what was happening in these different tasks, we still would find that disappointment when it comes to engaging with another person, it was the predominant feeling. It had it wasn't this like this, you know, heaty, heated anger, you know, that's you know out there on the edges of the circumplex that was motivating the decision to defect or, you know, like in the prisoner's dilemma or punish um, in the ultimatum game. And so in some ways, this suggests that maybe the idea that emotion is constructed very much by the context that it potentially arises, that it's actually not as sensitive to those contexts that we might think it is. Now, we haven't done systematic work in this space to really dig into whether that is true or not. So I'm saying this, you know, as just pulling a thread from the three different experiments that I showed you today. Um, but I think it's a, it's an interesting question whether how you know stable are these emotions given these let's say negative or positive emotional excuse me social interactions in eliciting things like disappointment or sadness or anger um the second question i think that you're touching on is conceptually how do people what what are the, what's the conceptual representation of emotion is that the other thing that you're thinking about um and i think that's such a great question and such a hard thing to study. Um, um, and I don't want to not answer the question, but I don't have good data to 
really discuss what are the conceptual representations um, outside of, let me see, I have something, if I can show you this. Outside of when we looked at the emotion classification work, what you can see is we can make essentially density plots of uh, how, for example, um, anger is, let me see if I can just get something um, here that would be interesting. Um, yeah, let me show you this. Um, do you mind if I reshare my screen? Yeah, go for it. So this is the only sort of hint I have about like the conceptual aspect of emotion. So when you look at the emotion classification data, um, what you can see is that in some cases, some emotions like relaxed on the arousal dimension or still are bimodally experienced. Some things are like neutral or aroused or not. They're, you know, they have a single peaked um, thing and it's also different for valence. There's like these large humps for something like nervous, um, which you can see here. And these density plots also show how things like angry, for example, can, for some people, anger is all the way up here at the edge of the circumflex. It's maximally unpleasant. It's maximally aroused. But for another group, within that, within our, our subjects, it's just negatively balanced without arousal. And so it's not that anger feels a certain way for all sorts of people. You can see the same thing with annoyance, which has this even larger spread and density. So, and, and sadness too. So this idea of what is a conceptual representation of emotions really interesting because it suggests that there's a large individual differences um, for some of the emotions um, compared to, let's say, some others like sleepy. Um, that would be really interesting to probe. Like, what does the, what does anger feel like for this person compared to this person? And how do those differentially impact our behaviors? Oh, that is fascinating. And thanks for sharing that additional data. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, especially in the context of some of the moral political context, we might think about anger especially being relevant for um, if people do differ in the representations of them in interesting systematic ways, yeah. that could be really fascinating. Yes, yeah. totally. Um, which was a semi-intentional segue into our first question. Um, so Chris Beam, one of my colleagues here at the McCourtney Institute for Democracy, mentions that in politics, it's well-established that fear and anger are prime motivators of, I think, like various political behaviors. Um, how might that fit with your findings about sadness being more of an operative driver of punishment in this context? Um, right. So, so I don't, we haven't done anything like what I showed here today with the emotion classification data and essentially removing the experimenters and having the model suss out what emotion is being felt in these um, situations, I think that's an interesting question. We have looked at some aspects of the political landscape. Um, and I don't want to be too reverse inferency here because some of it is um, using brain data. And so we find regions of um, the ins we find regions of ventral premedial prefrontal cortex, um, the TPJ, temporal parietal cortex, the anterior insula, and the OFC, orbital frontal cortex. Now, these, and excuse me, in striatum, if I didn't say that. Now, these regions are all involved in emotion, reward, and theory of mind. And so, without getting, you know, too down the rabbit hole of like inferring what exact emotions people might be feeling when consuming political content, the fact that there's those emo that those regions are coming online when we are consuming um, political content does suggest that there is an emotional quality to it, which aligns with this overarching theory of called um, effective polarization. I don't know if you're aware of this, but the effective polarization, one of the things that it talks about is we polarize against one another along this emotional dimension that we feel um, that we come to have this polarized interpret interpretation of content because it makes us feel these 
emotions of anger or annoyance or disappointment or disgust. Um, which one of those emotions in particular, I don't think is clear. I think the jury is still out. Great, thanks. Um, a couple more, we'll take like a few more questions before flipping over to, to Victor. Um, one of the, the next couple are about the nature of the affective dimensions. Um, so one from Brandon McDonald uh, commends you for the talk and the beautiful graphics. Um, for the model that looks at core affect along the two dimensions of arousal and valence, how would you adjust this model for children? Um, studies that children often assume this emotion behavior relationship or emotion prediction errors. Um, she would think that maybe limiting the grid size and the number of cells, i.e. less granularity, alongside perhaps a continuously adjusting facial expression as you hover over the grid, might that allow a way for children to convey their emotional experiences? And so I, I think she's asking if you can adapt this measure for testing developmental samples. Oh so. yeah, I love that question. So first of all, I have three children and I obviously test everything on my own children. <laughs> so, and my children are quite young, the oldest one is five. Um, so what I wanna tell you is that the five-year-old, the three-year-old less so, and the six months old, not at all, are really good at using the circumflex and understanding um, where people lie within this space. Um, so if you guide them initially um, with like examples of like, how does mommy feel when she wakes up in the morning? Um, they're good at saying, you know, very sleepy and putting um, essentially, you know, the cursor down here. Um, so, I think it's actually a great measure. It doesn't, so this, the, the subjects don't see the, um, they don't see a pixelated grid. They only see, let's see if I can show you this. Um, they just see this, this, this blank square and they're just asked to move it wherever. So for us, it's pixelated. We can get X, Y coordinates out of the entire space, but for the subject taking it, they don't know about they don't know about it on that sort of dimension, so they just put their emotions or wherever. And it's great for children because you know they can move all over. Another thing that I didn't mention about this grid that's really wonderful is that we have essentially mouse tracking in the space. So if you say to somebody like a child, you know, how would you feel if you know you won the egg drop race or something like that? Um, you can track as their mouse moves across the space and ends up and clicks in a certain part of the grid. And what's really nice about that measurement is that if a child isn't sure about what they're feeling, or an adult for that matter, there would be a greater arc in some direction, or it might like start over here and then end up over here. And so we can track um, the what how people are essentially thinking through their emotions, whether it's a child or an adult, until they get to the, like their final landing spot. Um, and it gives us a lot of um, leverage to understand at like how quickly an emotion comes online, we have awareness of that emotion and how predictive it ultimately is um, in that trajectory towards the ultimate choice of, you know, in these cases we ask about like punishing and so forth. Um, but the idea of having like a smiley face or something like that. I, I like that um, in theory, although I do think it's a little bit restrictive. One, we do have a collaboration with somebody who is rolling out, who has rolled out uh, a, um, um, an app, which essentially is, it's a, it looks at pain in um, different individuals. Um, and we have this grid. And so one of the things as we were putting it together is was, should we have something like a smiley face um, as you move about the space? But the problem is, is that a smiley face or an unhappy face doesn't exactly capture everything that is happening in here. And so ultimately we decided to go, you know, just with this um, grid without any sort of emojis on it. Um, but I would be curious to see what, the difference between having an emoji face and it moving its smiley face or not as you move across the grid might change how people ultimately feel and where they place things would be an interesting question to, to follow up with. So on that note of time, uh, there are a couple of questions 
that are focusing on this. Um, so Melody Munitz, uh, a former honor student, actually asked if there's a time constraint when completing the motion classification task. But then more generally, um, on the same vein, uh, Maria Teresa Alvarez Mateos has this question about whether the duration of the emotions in general is somehow included in the valence factor. Um, so like the duration of the emotions after reward and punishment, for example. Yeah, um, great question. So there's not um, a time limit for this emotion classification task. It only actually takes them about a few minutes, I think on average three to five minutes to do this. Um, when we look at, let me see where I have it here. When we look at um, the trajectory of emotion, um, one of the things, I'm just gonna draw it. So let's see if I can do this. I don't know why I can't do this, but it's gonna animate. Um, what, what we find is that people, they take as, they're allowed to take as long as they want when they're actually reporting how they feel in these ultimatum games or any other game. And we look at the mouse trajectory. What we see is that as early as less than a second, it's like three quarters of a second, depending on where it is in the trajectory of space. So like if you're over here, you're already like starting to come here. As soon as three quarters of a second, we can predict with a lot, very high accuracy. I can't remember exactly what it is, um, whether the person are, is going to accept or reject. So essentially to answer the question is that very early on in the emotional response, we see um, this highly predictive um, value of what the person is going to do given the trajectory of where the mouse is moving within the grid. Great. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like there'd be a lot of interesting and rich data to capture from this paradigm. Um, yeah. Well, one last question uh, uh, in the vein of, we've been focusing a lot on the subjective component. Um, so Reluca, Reluca Diana Sakeli has a question about whether you've tried to couple this classification task with other implicit or physiological forms of measurement, like skin conductance for, for skin, skin conductance for the arousal component, for example. Yeah. Just wondering how to complement other measures. But yeah, I think that's a great idea. We haven't done that yet. Um, that's a it, it's a hard slog to do something like that for a number of reasons. So like with SCR, um, as soon as you start moving your hand, uh, it you get spikes basically in the physiological response. You have to remain really still. So how do we track SCR? Do we have the other hand still? Well, you move this hand. So there's a lot of um, methodological constraints for doing something like that. I think it's a really interesting question to see how well the a person's self-reported um, feelings of you know, high arousal and unpleasantness actually map on to the arousal of like an SCR response or using pupil dilation, which would be another way that might be a little bit easier. Um, and it's something that in you know, the long-term plans of the lab that we hope to do, but we haven't set out to do it yet. All right, well, thanks for the excellent, the excellent questions. And if there are other questions for um, Dr. Feldman Hall, please do hold on to them and we'll, we'll come back. We'll have some time for kind of a round table discussion at the end. But I want to go ahead and flip it over to Victor Kumar, who will talk about the decline of anti-gay attitudes. Awesome. Thank you so much. That was such a fascinating talk, Oriel. I have lots of questions, and I'm going to have to somehow bracket them and put them out of my mind so I can um, give my presentation. But hopefully we have enough time at the end to have a conversation. Um, so yeah, as Daryl said, uh, I'm going to be talking about the decline of anti-gay attitudes today. And I think in one way, uh, talking about their decline is a bit ironic in the current political context. You know, right, we're at a moment right now, a really um, depressing, uh, terrible moment in lots of ways politically. But one way is that uh, there's been this assault on LGBTQ rights in this country, especially intensifying over the last three or four years. Um, even though there has been this backlash, though, I think it's important to remember that um, there, over the last 40 or 50 years, been, there's been enormous progress for gay people in this country. So just for example, you know, if you were openly gay uh, 40 or 50 years ago, you would be most likely um, rejected by your family, um, excluded from your religious community, fired from your job, 
And of course, all of these things still happen to gay people in the US and other places, but they're much less common. Um, so what I'm interested in is um, from both a empirical and philosophical perspective, trying to understand the decline of gay anti-gay attitudes, especially for the purpose of thinking about how to further their decline, but also how people might fight back against the, the backlash against um, gay, but especially trans people in this country. So here's a plan for the talk. I'm gonna talk in a little bit more detail about the decline of anti-gay attitudes, zoom in on, on this phenomenon a little bit. Uh, in the second part of the talk, I'm going to look at one mechanism, one psychological and cultural mechanism that I think has been at play in driving the decline of these attitudes. And then in the third and final part of the talk, I'll draw some general, um, some little lessons. Okay, so um, I think we've seen progress for gay people in the US and many other countries in a lot of different ways. Um, we've seen the erosion of stigma, hostility, and exclusion. Uh, gay people are less often medicalized and pathologized. Anti-gay slurs are less common and culturally less acceptable. I grew up in the 90s and that's so gay or you're so gay was like the most common insult that you could have in most social groups uh, at that time. And people still say that, but it's, it's less common and less acceptable. Um, Oppressive laws have been repealed over the past few decades, and probably uh, you know a major example that comes to people's minds is um, the is enactment of marriage equality in 2015. Now, I want to focus specifically on attitude change, and I think it's important to note that when you're thinking about progress for gay people, that encompasses lots of different changes. It encompasses, um, in particular, systemic changes to our laws and institutions. Um, attitude change is only one part of gay progress, but it's an important part. One reason it's important is that it can lead to systemic change. It can lead to um, changing our laws and our institutions. That's what I'm gonna focus on in this talk. Um, but I think before I continue, I should note that, um, you know, this progress hasn't gone far enough, of course. You can believe that progress has occurred and yet think that it hasn't gone far enough. There's also been, as I, as I noted, um, some intense backlash uh, in recent years. Um, there's also been less progress in some countries, some cultures, in some rural places as opposed to big cities. There's been less progress for gay people who are from low socioeconomic backgrounds, um, gay people of color, people in counter-normative relationships or identities. Still, um, I think that it's still true that this is one of the most significant episodes of moral progress that at least I've witnessed in, in my lifetime. So um, how did it happen? But first of all, before we get to that, what exactly happened? I, I just want to zoom in on one measure of this attitude change, this decline in anti-gay attitudes. And what I want to do is turn to people's attitudes towards same-sex marriage. So there's been lots of different research by um, places like Pew Research Center, Biolab, looking at people's attitudes towards same-sex marriage over the last 20 or 30 years. In roughly the last 20 years, people have gone from roughly 30 to 35% of adults in America have been in favor of some same-sex marriage to now we are at about 70 to 75% of American adults are in favor of same-sex marriage. So there's been huge changes in a relatively short period of time. Um, but one thing that's worth noting is that this change has been really broad. It's not just the young liberals who are changing their minds. It's lots of different people are changing their minds. So here's um, a little chart that chart, this is also from Pew, that looks at different generations. And so you can see that it's not just millennials and Gen X that have um, become more in favor of same-sex marriage. This is over the course of 10 years, 2005 to 2015, but also baby boomers, people from the silent generation have also become more accepting. Um, it's not just Democrats, it's not just liberals that have changed their minds. It's also Republicans as well. And finally, it's not, uh, it's people from a quite wide range of religious orientations. So 
um, you, you know, the top line here are people who are religiously unaffiliated, but people who are white mainline Protestants, Catholics, Slack Protestants, white evangelicals, all these people have become um, uh, more accepting, more in favor of same-sex marriage. So that's one of the things I think to note, which is that the, in general, the change in attitude has not just been large and fast, but it's also been broad over, it's been occurring across a number of different demographic groups. And um, you get similar results if you look at other ways. So for example, Tessa Charlesworth um, has this great data, data on implicit and explicit anti-gay attitude, anti attitudes that shows something quite similar. Okay, so that's the decline of gay anti-gay attitude. Then now I wanna talk about one, one mechanism that I think underpins this change in attitude. Now, the first thing I wanna say about this is that there's lots of different mechanisms at play. We could spend this whole two hours just laying out the causal space of like different mechanisms that might be in play in underpinning gay progress more generally and the decline of anti-gay attitudes more specifically. So there's lots of questions from many areas of social science to look at from history to sociology, political science, but also cognitive science as well. And these, the answers to these questions matter. They matter from a social scientific perspective, but they also adder, matter from the perspective of, of public ethics. They matter for activists, um, politicians, policymakers, educators, the leader of firms. If we have some better idea about why anti-gay attitudes declined in the past, then we might be able to um, put our hands on the levers for um, furthering um, progressive attitudes in this domain, but also in others as well. Um, so lots of different mechanisms, things like activism, legislation, media, public relations, uh, democratic, demographic turnover. You know, like one thing that's at, been at play, I think, is that um, people who are bigoted are no longer with us to answer, answer polls anymore. Um, but I want to focus specifically on psychological mechanisms and not just psychological mechanisms generally, but one psychological mechanism in particular. I want to focus on the way in which interpersonal connections reduce anti-gay prejudice. And so um, the idea here is that when people uh, discover that a friend or a family member or someone else they know, someone on television is gay, that that puts them in a position to better appreciate um, the way in which that person is discriminated against, but also the way in which their prejudice, their prejudice rests on mistakes, on factual mistakes about what that person is like, what kind of um, friend they are, what kind of parent they are, uh, what their relationship with their partner is like. And you know, there's all kinds of research in social science about the way that interpersonal connections, social contact, friendships can reduce prejudice. But this has this has been a particularly powerful force when it comes to anti-gay attitudes, because of two features of sexual orientation as a trait. One is that it's relatively invisible, which means that many people can come to know and love and care deeply about someone and then late, only later on discover that that person is gay. That's much harder to do with other outgroups. So for example, think about race. It's almost, it almost never occurs that you get to know and love someone before knowing that they're a member of a racial outgroup. Another, um, another distinct feature here is that uh, sexual orientation is what's called a horizontal trait. Vertical traits are ones that are passed downward in family lineages. Horizontal traits are distributed across populations. And uh, that means that sexual orientation is more or less randomly distributed across, um, across the United States and other, other places. And so what that means is that many people uh, discover that they have a friend or a family member who's gay. So, you know, you think about this is the kind of way in which straight and gay people are naturally socially integrated with each other. Think about the contrast with race. You know, there's so much segregation between white and black people, not just in terms of where they live, but where they work and where they go to school. 
Um, and that reduces the possibility of interpersonal connections across racial and ethnic boundaries. But because sexual orientation is this horizontal trait, that means that there are that there's just much more potential for straight and gay people to form interpersonal connections. Okay, so I think this is an important driver of um, the decline of anti-gay attitudes, but it doesn't work by itself. It's part, it, there's a kind of interaction between psychological factors and what you might classify as structural factors. There's a positive feedback loop between them. And so I wanna sketch out this uh, feedback loop for you. Um, and maybe for sake of time, I'll skip examples, but I think you can maybe put together just from these pictures, the examples that um, I had in mind of the way in which interpersonal connections can reduce prejudice. The, the one that might be harder to put together is um, Dick Cheney discovered that his, found out that his daughter was gay and that changed his mind about, about gay people and about same-sex marriage. So you don't even have to be a very good person for this to work on you. Okay, but here's how this, um, sorry for that interruption, but here's, here's how this positive feedback loop that I, am, that I referred to uh, works. And so if you think about this in terms of, um, of the US kites, there were, especially in the 1970s, certain cultural pockets in which gay identities were accepted and celebrated. And in the US, these were mainly cities like New York, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Washington, DC. Um, these were gay villages where gay people um, congregated and lived together in the same community. Um, and because there were these gay villages, it meant that more and more gay people could live public and candid lives because they could be open about their sexuality and still have access to various kinds of social good and not risk hostility and violence. As a result of that, uh, more and more people discovered that a friend or family member is gay. And so because of this interpersonal connection, it was easier for these people, straight people predominantly, but also gay people too, to um, realize that the gay people in their life were harmed, that these people were not morally deviant in the way that anti-gay ideology portrayed them to be. Um, they also had to engage in a kind of consistency reasoning. They had to generalize this in from the particular gay person in their lives to other people they didn't know. So they had to think, well, you know, if if I don't want people to discriminate against my friend or my cousin, then maybe I shouldn't discriminate against other gay people that I don't know personally. As a result of this, more and more people came to accept and celebrate gay identities. And that meant that that led to more and more gay people living public and candid lives, which meant that more and more people discovered that a friend or family member is gay, changed their mind, made culture more accepting. The idea here is that there's a, been a kind of positive feedback loop between the change in attitude and changes in our social structure. Really broadly put, the more that gay and straight people are integrated, the more that interpersonal connections can reduce prejudice, which then leads to more and more integration and so on. Okay, so that's one mechanism. So I've talked so far about the way in which anti-gay attitudes have declined in a way that's been fairly large, fairly quick, and fairly broad across different demographic groups. And this mechanism that I've been talking about, this progressive, this positive feedback loop between um, uh, inter, uh, interpersonal connections and social integration, um, has helped drive, it's not it's obviously not been the only important factor, but it's been one mechanism that has led to this decline. And it's also, I mean, one of the things that's interesting about this mechanism is that it can explain why the decline has been so broad. It's not just younger people. It's not just Democrats. It's not just people who are atheists or um, mainline Protestants, because people from all of these categories um, have, over the last many decades, discovered that a friend or family member is gay because, as I said before, 
you know, sexual orientation is, is this horizontal trait that's distributed across the population. Okay, now I wanna to turn to some general lessons. And I wanna focus particularly on trans prog progress. And there's a question here because it's not clear that there's been any trans progress in this country, at least not nearly, I mean, I think it's clear that there's been not, not nearly as much uh, progress for trans people as there has been for gay people. Um, so why is that? Uh, sorry, the, the first thing I want to say is, is just to describe this, which is to say, um, you know, there's there remains intense stigma, hostility, and exclusion towards gay, towards trans people, um, and we've seen in the last few years a rise of anti-trans legislation, particularly at the at the level of um, states, um, and there's been also a lack of attitude change, or at least lack of absence of as significant attitude change. It's not entirely clear. I mean, it's possible that there's been some polarization with people on the left becoming more accepting of trans people and people on the right becoming less accepting of trans people. Um, there's, def there's definitely not as much data here and there's probably more data than I know about because I, I'm not a social scientist myself. But just for example, this is one um, bit of data from, um, this is also from Pew, which looks at the proportion of people um, who say that whether a person is a man or a woman is either um, can be different from the sex that's assigned at birth or is determined by the sex that's assigned at birth. And maybe this is surprising to you, it was surprising to me that actually fewer and fewer people think that someone's gender can be different from the sex assigned at birth. More and more people think that um, it's determined by what's assigned at birth. Um, so this is just one way in which it's not just that there's been a failure of anti-trans attitudes to decline, it's that there's been an intensification. As I say, I think, I think it's reasonable to think that there's polarization here. Um, so, you know, in, it's in part because of this attitude change. I mean, it's, it's, this attitude change has been, has, or the absence of attitude change has um, uh, occurred as, as I say, there's been this wave of anti-trans legislation in the country. So um, across almost all of the states in the country, there are bills that have been passed or that are under consideration that um, advocate discrimination, um, that permit discrimination against trans people. So probably the most important class of bills here are ones that prevent trans people from accessing gender affirming medical care or that prevent um, adolescents from accessing it or that punish doctors or the parents of children from for um, providing it to their children. Um, there's also legislation that uh, prevents trans people from participating in the sports that correspond to the gender they identify with. And um, another major category here, uh, there continues to be trans um, anti-trans bathroom bills that prevent trans people from using um, the bathroom that corresponds to their gender identity. So um, I want to next turn to thinking about the mechanism that I've been talking about and what lessons it has for thinking about the decline of, or the possible decline of anti-trans attitudes. So one thing here is that you might wonder like, well, why haven't anti-trans attitudes declined? You know, I'm a psychologist, but I do teach psychology. And uh, one of the things that I love talking about with students is the way in which like things that seem natural, like na seem like natural features of our psychology, there's no necessity that it had to be that way. You know, you could imagine other evolved creatures being completely different. And there's no necessity here either. I mean, you could have imagined different history where right now anti-trans attitudes had declined and anti-gay attitudes hadn't really moved anywhere. Um, so I mean, I think this is a difference that requires an explanation. And I think there's lots of factors here that go into the explanation, but you might think, well, well, why hasn't it happened? I mean, it's, you know, whether you're, when you're, whether a person is trans is also a trait that at least often can be relatively invisible. And it's also a horizontal trait that's distributed across the population. So why, why haven't we seen the same kind of um, phenomenon where inter interpersonal connections lead to the decline of prejudice? 
I mean, I think there are all factors here. One of them is that there are just fewer trans people, at least in America, than there are gay people. You know, the rough estimates is that there's something something like 10% of the ten uh, percent of Americans are gay, and roughly one to two percent of Americans are trans. And so this just means that there are fewer and fewer there, there are just fewer um, cisgender people who have been able to discover that a friend or family member is gay. Another factor here is that trans people are less prone to affiliate with each other than gay people are, just by nature, because by virtue of the identity, like gay people are, you know, interested obviously in having romantic relationships with other gay people, but trans people are not necessarily. So there hasn't been the same incentive to um, to develop uh, trans communities in as there has been to develop gay communities. Um, nevertheless, I think that uh, one general lesson is that interpersonal connections can be a powerful force for driving the decline of anti-trans attitudes. Um, but somewhat different mechanisms and somewhat different routes to this um, result might, might, might come, to, come into play over the next few decades. So, um, you know, one thing that, uh, so, so just to be explicit here, what I mean is that I think that if we're gonna see trans progress in this country, I think it's likely going to happen because there are more and more interpersonal connections developed between cisgender and transgender people, and cis people can um, uh, relinquish their prejudices because they discover they discover the way in which their prejudices are based on falsehoods, as they are better able to appreciate that the trans people they know and care about are being harmed and discriminated against. Um, I think that. Um, <clears throat> From this perspective, it becomes a little bit clear that represent representation matters. You know, on film in film and television, but of course in in other parts of our public life as well. So, you know, it's important that we have trans characters on on TV and in films, and it's important too that they are played by trans actors, because people develop relationships, not just. Imagine, not just imaginary relationships with characters, but also parasocial relationships with the actors that play them. And this is one way in which, um, in one way in which, uh, you know, representation matters because it can actually drive uh, the decline of anti-trans prejudice. Um, so representation is not just this meaningless tribute to political correctness. It actually materially matters. It's not just symbolic. Um, another factor here is that social media can overcome the low numbers of trans people that exist in in this country. So, so like you know, I was saying earlier that like, well, one difference here is that like there are there are more gay people, and so you know, easier for gay people to find communities where they could be open about their identity and avoid hostility and stigma. And this is what happened in many urban centers beginning in the 1960s and 70s. But um, even though there are fewer numbers of trans people, we have something that we didn't have in the 70s, which is social media, which provides a way that you can um, create communities online. And even if there are fewer members of a marginalized group, they can more easily find each other online than they can in physical space. Now, um, <clears throat> I think there's an objection to all of this that is worth airing. I mean, basically what I'm saying here is like, well, we need trans people to be more open about their identity so that there can be a greater number of interpersonal relationships between cis and trans people. But the problem with that, with that is that it puts an enormous burden on trans people to live open and candid lives. And that puts them at great personal risk of not just stigma, but also violence. And it also, in some cases, contravenes their preferences about their openness. You know, not every trans person wants to be open to others that they are trans. And so it's like what we're asking for here is, is, is you know, it imposes really significant costs on trans people. 
um, so this is an important objection. And you know, if you've been to a philosophy talk before, you kind of expect like, okay, the speaker, they give this objection, but then they like refute it in the next bullet point. But actually I don't have like a strong rotation of this point. I think just, it is a serious objection that I think I wanna think about more and I want others to think about too. I mean, I guess I do have a response <laughs> characteristically as a philosopher. I mean, I guess I just wonder whether this is still the best tool at our disposal. Um, and I think it is still the best, it, it, it might be the best tool because of the way in which um, interpersonal connections can drive this kind of positive feedback loop. You know, if you look at some of the other mechanisms, some of the other tools that people use to fight prejudice, they're ones that, um, you know, uh, they can work, but then they, other people can use similar, can use the same tool um, to push in the opposite direction. So for example, think about legislative changes. Legislative changes are enormously important in reducing prejudice when it comes to gay and trans people, but they can also be used to further prejudice too. I mean, you think about the fight for safe access to abortion in this country, which was driven by legislative changes, but the problem is, is when, you know, the wrong people win elections or congressmen, you know, refuse to install uh, Supreme Court nominees that legislative changes can go in the opposite direction too. And so I think that interpersonal connections here are an effective tool because they drive this positive feedback loop. And they're also, I'm still work, workshopping this term here. So give me, give me an alternative if you, if you like, but they're also a single edged sword. That is, they're a tool that is kind of biased in a progressive direction. It's not a tool that can be used, um, unlike say, anti-trans activism or anti-trans legislation. It's not a tool that can be used in, a, in the same way as a, in a, in a regressive um, direction. What I mean here is that I think that, um, of course, you know, if you if you hang around with anti-trans bigots, maybe you'll pick up some of their their bigotry. But um, the, the idea here is that uh, that people who uh, have friends or family members who are gay or trans, I think, are more likely to be uh, to accept them than they are to accept the bigotry of friends and family members who are anti-gay or anti-trans. I mean, maybe this is not uh, a fact, but a hope. The hope is that that love is stronger than hate. Um, okay, so maybe you think some of this stuff is plausible, but the more general idea that I really wanna give you, uh, whether you believe in any of the details, is that if you're interested in thinking about how to fight backlash against gay and trans people in this country, that it's critically important to think about how progress was achieved for gay people in this country over the last 50 years and trying to draw some lessons. Using social science to understand how this happened can provide us with lessons to uh, move forward in the future. Thank you for listening. And I also want to thank my collaborators, Richmond Campbell and Leanne Young. Thanks, everyone. Great, thanks, thanks, Victor. Really fascinating talk. And um, as I was listening, I was also trying, you know, there's various connections I can, trying to draw connections between your talk and Oriol's talk too, and thinking about the role of uh, predictions and learning across groups. Um, we'll take a few questions, um, much as we did for Oriol's talk. If anyone has questions about Victor's talk, please drop them in the Q&A. And I think one, there's numerous questions. I think one, one of them is just trying to like further embed. So some of the points in the first talk about prediction errors and learning. I'm familiar with some work in social neuroscience looking at prediction errors, both in the context of intergroup prejudice. And so learning that, for example, an interaction with an outgroup member is more positive than you thought it would be, like how that could feed forward into less prejudiced, I believe it was attitudes several years ago now. Um, thinking about how that might be part of complementary to some of the relational pieces that you were talking about. 
So I'm just curious if that's a one way to bridge thoughts about prediction error with interactions across groups. And I'm just curious if either of you have any thoughts or see any potentials for connections there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great idea about the connection. I mean, I think, um, you know, so one idea is whether someone who is anti-gay or anti-trans has certain um, predictions about the other group that are that are frustrated when they meet a particular individual. I guess um, more specifically thinking about Oriel's work, I was thinking about um, what kind of emotional expectations someone like that might have upon interacting with someone from from <clears throat> from an out groups generally, but from um, uh, you know a gay or trans person, and whether uh, whether the prediction errors there might might um, predict or explain um, how likely someone is to uh, to relinquish their their bigotry. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> one thing that I guess I, I would ask you, or I don't know if you know this, but just essentially, what are what is the scope of the landscape of emotions when people think about um, trans populations? What what emotions are evoked? when they consider that and it would be interesting also to see that when you you broke out broke out your data as a function of religious beliefs democratic republican beliefs and like you're saying that there's systematic you know sort of groundswell for let's say you know gay populations but there's also a huge gap between Democrats and Republicans. I think I saw it was at 30 per, a 30% gap and certainly in the religious domain as well, we were looking at like from the highest, which was in the eighties, I think it was like unaffiliated um, to white evangelical, the gap was like in the, maybe even in the forties. So I would be very curious to see if, if there was an emotional schema that was relevant to the lower the people who have less ground spell over time i mean their their numbers have have doubled as well but are still very different from those at the top of the charts um what those emotions are and then also that to compare them to what the emotions would have been to gays 30 years ago or 50 years ago compared to what they are now um, to see if that is in fact some sort of like expectation, ex emotional expectation versus the experience that you then have with an individual of this minoritized group and see how that disconnect happens. Yeah, that's really, really fascinating. I'd love to, I'd love to see work on that. I guess my initial guess is that an emotion like disgust is probably um, more likely the, the emotion at play among people who are anti-gay, anti-trans, but you know, I would have guessed anger for. I'm not sure. Maybe I would have guessed anger for the ultimating game. So I think you know, predictions about this are are um, are fallible. Um, there's there's some interesting data. I I don't remember exactly all the details about it. That this idea of purity, which I think is what you're talking about when you you know when you uh, look at disgust, isn't always on. Um, the, the moralized content of disgust isn't always about like purity per se. And you can imagine that moralized issues like trans and gay might also actually bring it, issues of anger up of like, if you're deviating from what you believe to be the socially normative way to live one's life, it makes me angry um, not just disgusted, but angry that you're deviating from this, what I believe to be a socially normative, acceptable lifestyle. Yeah, I, I would bet that it depends on the context evaluation here. I mean, you think about things like people who are upset at sexual uh, orientation being discussed in their child's classroom or drag shows happening at the public library. I mean, I, I think in in those areas, I, I would not be surprised if anger is the is uh, more likely to be at play. So build, so building off that uh, discussion, uh, so Josh Rotman has a question that I think is relevant to sort of the, it's kind of the unlearning of exclusive attitudes. And so he praises you for your talk and says that 
wonders what you think about the possibility the phenomenon you're investigating is not primarily a product of moral learning, but rather its opposite. In other words, if anti-gay and anti-trans prejudice is culturally learned in progress and the in progress and the decline of anti-gay attitudes may be due to a significant reduction of anti-gay discourse for young people to learn from. And so greater contact slash empathy may facilitate and reinforce inclusion, but exclusion also is learned and interpersonal contact or parasocial contact, as you described, might merely reaffirm the moral worth of gay and trans people in ways that don't require special kind of learning. And so is it, I think the question is basically, is it that people who are more inclusive is because of the absence of learning these more uh, kind of prejudicial sorts of, uh, from, these more, from these more prejudicial sources of information? I think that's a, Fantastic, fantastic uh, set of ideas, Josh, and I more or less agree with you entirely. I mean, one thing that I said so briefly in the talk, but is worth emphasizing, is that um, is that even if we restrict ourselves to psychological explanations for this, there's an enormous diversity of mechanisms that are likely at play. Um, so, it, yeah, I mean, I think that uh, the things that we might that might be operating here is not, <clears throat> I mean, I think that I encourage this maybe misconception at certain points at the top is that people are changing their minds. And I think that's often true for older people, but what what's true for younger people is that they are, you know, they don't already have a bunch of anti-gay ideology because of the much different cultural environment in which they grow up. And so I think interpersonal connections matter in the sense that um, they help young people who have gay friends or you know uh, admire uh, gay gay characters on TV or gay influencers on YouTube, um, that that can lead to them being more accepting. But yeah, another factor is that um, they they don't they're not they don't learn the exclusion that um, older generations learned. Yeah. Did you have a follow up thought, Oriel? Yeah. So, just one thing that came to my mind is this idea of changing one's mind. So, I think that when it comes to um, interpersonal uh, interactions between individuals, flexibility of um, thought, experience and expectations is actually an important thing for relationships, for inter for the success, success of interpersonal relationships. And you can imagine, let's say, getting into an argument with someone that you care about and you want them to see things from their point of view, but, you know, they're, you know, very entrenched in how they saw something unfold. So getting them to essentially change their mind, empathize, think about, you um, the other side of the equation of what that person is trying to say is really important for the success of that relationship. So interpersonally, changing one's mind is important for relationship success. But you apply that same metric to politicians or to people who are governing policy and people who change, um, politicians who change their mind are lambasted. They're like, they're, they're gone off after with pitchforks because there's no consistency. They said one thing here, then they're saying another thing here. So how do you think about, Victor, how do you think about those two sides of the coin where on one hand it matters on a one-on-one -on -one way, but when we're looking at on like the political amphitheater, it's like has a totally different um, flavor and it's looked at in a very negative light. I mean, I think it's fascinating. I think the general idea here that different relationships um, permit or, or facilitate uh, different priority on consistency over time, like small scale interpersonal relationships, uh, you know, it, it's okay to change your mind. And what citizens want from politicians is someone who's stable and uh, resolute. And maybe there's good reason for that because you want someone who, you know, whose policies when you elected them, when they were campaigning, will continue to be the ones that they have when they're governing. Um, <clears throat> but I think it's remarkable in the way that uh, many, you know, prominent politicians have changed their mind about um, about about gay people, about same marriage. So, like 
I mentioned um, Dick Cheney earlier, who changed his mind in like the middle of, or, or I think early to mid, uh, early to mid uh, period of um, of George W. Bush's presidency. And so, uh, you know, I think that the the powerful pull that um, it, that his daughter, his relationship with his daughter, had him was stronger than the pull he felt from citizens to be um, consistent. I mean, another example is is Obama, right? Obama, as late as like I think two thousand twelve, was against same sex marriage, um, and I think that you know some of these some of these you know i think there's like a tipping point in some of these um attitude changes i think like yes you want to be cons you know people want a politician to be consistent but they don't want them to they don't prize consistency all over all of the other values they have and if they come to really care about gay rights then that can that can trump their desire for consistency So let's see. Yeah. So yeah, I did also wonder about yeah, the role of consistency-based reasoning. I mean, it, there's all kinds of interesting questions with broader discussions in psychology about moralization of different issues and how um, you know, taking one case and applying it and applying other principles to encompass that particular case can be useful. Um, let's see. So there are a couple of different questions about your talk. So I'll start with India Oates, who um, my lab manager. Um, interesting talk um, regarding the importance of interpersonal connections. India has seen some work that finds that sometimes knowing a person in a marginalized group doesn't open them up to fully accepting the group. Instead, they deem the person they have connection with as an exception to their, to their otherwise prejudicial attitudes. Um, she's unsure of the mechanism behind these divergent reactions, but she's curious your thoughts about this. How can you um, instill a broadly accepting mindset in those who currently hold more of this exception sort of mindset? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a great question. Um, you know, the the research that I'm familiar with um, talks about this in terms of subtyping. Um, so yes, uh, you come to accept your daughter who is gay or trans, but you create a kind of a, a special subtype for them. Oh, well, this person is okay, but I'm not, I don't wanna change my mind about these other people who are say, you know, not, who don't, who aren't, don't participate in sexually monogamous relationships or who are um, in some other way, you know, counter normative. I mean, I think this is a real, uh, this is a real, <clears throat> this, this, this happens a lot and I think one of the things that it does is it can help explain certain kinds of intersectional patterns of disadvantage. Because I think what, well, I think, you know, uh, anecdotally, it seems like many gay and trans people on TV and in media are white and high socioeconomic status. And I think that uh, other ways, you know, more normative. And um, <laughs> I think what happens is that people, uh, make exceptions for them and they don't generalize that attitude for people who are of uh, people of color or people of low socioeconomic status. So your question though is about um, how to overcome that kind of um, those special exceptions and subtyping. I mean, I think that one of the important mechanisms, I mean, I, I don't know that there's any good shortcuts because I think the most effective thing here is to have to build interpersonal relationships with a diverse range of people. And so it becomes harder and harder to make special exceptions for the person you know. I mean, you might initially, but then you have an interpersonal connection with somebody else. And it's like, oh, well, wait, they don't fall into that subtype. So, well, except for these two, but then you meet someone else and you have to create another exception. And it's like, you could maybe keep doing that. You could keep making, introducing new subtypes that prevent you from generalizing. But there's a kind of, I wonder if people make, I wonder if people are clever enough to kind of do a kind of induction here, which is like, well, 
I keep making these subtypes, I keep making these exceptions, but they don't hold up upon further uh, evidence, further interaction. Maybe, maybe um, there aren't any relevant subtypes here. So, I mean, I think that's the main thing, which is not just, you know, knowing one person from an outgroup, but knowing a wide range of people. I think that's probably the most effective thing for combating this, this kind of um, subtyping. And so, so Maria Teresa Alvarez Mateos has a related question that I think you partially answered in, in response to India, which was just about the generalization from you know, empathy for attachments to one particular person to the broader collective or the broader group to which that person of which that person is a member. Um, and she just asked, you know, is tolerance in this case to generalizing to the collective a matter of empathy or some kind of inductive abstraction, like you were suggesting? Hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, I think this is a good, this is a really good question. And I think, you know, part of what I just said now, I think speaks to, speaks to that. But um, I do think some abstraction is evolved, involved, right? I mean, one of the, one of the classic views of empathy is that it's enumerate. You know, you can't, you can feel empathy for one person, but you can't feel a thousand times as much empathy for a thousand people. Um, it doesn't, or maybe another better way of putting it is that empathy doesn't scale up. So some abstraction is, is required. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> I mean, you know, one thing that Leanne Young and I have talked about in our work, I think we're kind of undecided about this, has to do with another mechanism that seems to be, it seems to have been at play in driving the decline of anti-gay and perhaps some decline of anti-trans attitudes, which is psychological essentialism. Um, you know, one of the interesting features of essentialism is that the more you accept, more people essentialize outgroups, it's associated with greater prejudice, with some exceptions. And one of the exceptions is 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 gay people. So actually, the more people essentialize, more straight people essentialize gay people, the more accepting they are of them. It's unclear exactly what the causal relationship there is, but. Um, but the, the general idea is the is that, well, if you think that someone is born that way, then it makes a lot less sense to blame them for their behavior and to try to get them to change. So this is, sorry, this is a bit of background to answer your question, which is Leanne and I have been talking about, and we haven't settled on this yet, but we, have, we, we keep going back and forth, which is we wonder whether essentialism can prevent people can help people abstract, which is to think that, um, well, uh, the step is like, okay, I, I, I think this person in my life isn't doing anything wrong. And if I think that everyone who is gay is gay because of some deep underlying hidden essence, then that's, that can be something that helps me abstract and say, well, that person is gay just for the same reasons that that my daughter or that my cousin is gay. Um, and so if the thing that makes them gay is the same, then maybe that's at least in people's minds reason for them to, to abstract and generalize. Yeah, Oriel. So if we follow that logical reasoning out in terms of understanding a lack of movement, with trans populations, is the suggestion there that it's a choice? Um, I don't, so, I, so this is complicated. So one thing is, no, it may be that there are many other factors that are explaining why there isn't this decline, like the fewer number of trans people like them being less likely to affiliate, things that I was pointing to in my talk. The other thing here though, is that even though I think people believe, some people believe that gay people are born that way, trans people are born that way. Um, I think there's a lot of individual variation. So, I mean, some people, some gay people report their sexuality as a choice. Some trans people report their gender identity as a choice. Um, and so 
so sorry, th th this caveat is just to say that I think that if, if we're trying to explain people's attitudes, I think it's important to acknowledge that there is this belief that gay and trans people are born that way. It doesn't necessarily um, correspond with the actual oh, sorry. ideology. Yeah, yeah, I didn't mean it that way. I meant it from the from the point of view is that the people who are failing to reach this, you know, like acceptance are attributing it to a choice. And of course, like I, there, it's psychology. Oh. There's a million one variables that um, uh, will predict something, and and being able to soak up variance by adding more things is interesting. I meant it just from the point of view of the people who are failing to see it, who are failing to accept it, are are attributing it to a choice that the essential the psychological essentialism the other yeah. side of that and you know something that might be an important aspect of that is that well sexual sexuality is not necessarily binary right so you can be bi you don't have to you know be heterosexual you could also be gay there is there is a scale in some way gender in particular as it is discussed you know in the way that we talk about it now is is very much scaled on a, in a granular way right there it is i mean for some people it's binary but for a lot of people it's not um and i wonder if that speaks a little bit to this you know psychological essentialism being one reason why you know people are not accepting um, a trans lifestyle mm. Yeah, sorry, thanks for clarifying. And I think that's a really compelling hypothesis. I'd love to see some studies that that look at that. Um, I mean, I think one further reason to think that this hypothesis has got something to it is that people essentialize gender. Mm -hmm. And so if you think that really like, if people are thinking that whether you're a man or a woman is determined by some biological essence, then they might draw the conclusion that being trans has to be a choice because you're because there's something well there, not 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 that your gender is a choice but how you present as a choice you can't really um that that this isn't driven by something deep and stable because uh because uh, there's like this disconnect right between the fact that biologically you are born with certain sex organs that put you into a camp However, gender and biological sex do not map onto each other. And yet for so long in much of like the common discourse, they did. And so now there's this, there is this, you know, gender and biological sex for so many years were talked about as a one-to-one -one mapping. And I would say, and I'm not sure, I don't follow this research very that closely like you do, but there's X number of years or decades in which there is now space between gender and biological space, uh, sex that they are not, there is not a one-to-one -one mapping, right? So you have to, there's it's, like, sorry, yeah, go ahead. It's super interesting. And I think like there's questions that are about the relationship between gender and sex. And then there's questions about that are more psychological questions about how people conceive of the relationship. But I think like, Things are changing and there's lots of difference of opinion. I mean, I think there are some people who are um, trans inclusive who want to put sex and gender together. And I think like the most, because they think that sex isn't biological either, or purely logical. And I think the most plausible discussions that I've seen of this um, are ones that try to understand sex and gender as both like biocultural traits that are both the product of gene culture coevolution, and um, you know that that like so many other human traits are like product of um, interaction between 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 genes and culture, and so they don't. These people don't want to put sex um, on the on the purely biological side either. But it's interesting that I'm thinking you're right about the way that opinions have changed about this. So in thinking about the looping mechanism that you mentioned earlier, Victor, there is one more question in the queue uh, from, from Melody Munitz asking about, you mentioned the potential power of social media and creating specifically trans communities as a means to leverage the positive feedback loop you outlined for anti-gay attitude decrease. However, as opposed to the somewhat parallel cases of uh, gay villages in highly visible urban areas you mentioned earlier, a lot of these digital havens are more siloed and intentionally limited 
to trans identifying individuals is to remain intentionally safe spaces. And so Melody's wondering, what are your thoughts about the differences between these cases? How might we leverage the feedback loop amidst this? This is a great point. And I think, um, you know, on first blush, it seems right to me that there is this difference that there, um, you know, in, in, in gay communities in the 70s or 80s, you just were limited in terms of how much siloing there could be. Um, this is a question where like, I feel like I immediately want to talk to the undergraduates in my lab, because I want to get their insight about how social media works, because I think they know more than I do about this. And um, so I want to hear what they say. One one thought that I have, though, is that um, I wonder, I think it's true that there is this kind of siloing and intentional exclusion of, of cisgender people. But I think that, that this um, is limited and temporary. So I think it's limited in that many spaces do welcome allies in addition to, um, in addition to um, trans people. Um, I mean, those aren't the people that really, their attitudes need to be changed, but um, the, idea, the, the idea is that um, siloed space can be ones that are safe and allow trans people to um, openly express their identity in a safe way, and then eventually participate in other spaces online that are less siloed. Um, so I think that, I mean, I don't, I think this is like, this is like grist for the mill, which is that social media can more easily facil facilitate these spaces because they can provide a safer place for trans people to really um, understand and express their identity before occupying spaces that are less silent. Great, so we have a few minutes left before our cutoff at three. Um, you know, I guess- I'd love to talk about, ask some questions to Oriel because I feel like I yeah, haven't really before. had yeah. a chance. I mean, I thought the talk was just so, so fascinating um, in a couple of different ways. I mean, one is that you have this method, this new method for, um, studying what what emotions people are actually experiencing that doesn't rely at least directly on self-report. Um, and the other thing is that's so fascinating about it is this predictive processing work, which has been so powerful in other domains of learning, and at least in my experience, has not really been as powerful yet in 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 moral and social learning. And I think it's it's really exciting. Um, another reason why this is exciting before I ask you a question is that, you may know about this, that there's this long tradition in philosophy that's, there's these two long traditions. One is called rationalism and the other is called sentimentalism. Rationalists think that reasoning and rational inference is at play in moral judgment. And sentiment, sentimentalism is the idea that emotions are really what's driving it. And I think what's so interesting about this is the way in which it integrates both rationalist and sentimentalist modes of thought. Um, <clears throat> it's interesting um, that so I have to I have to pick a question here. Um, it's interesting that disgust is the emotion that's at play in leading people to reject in the ultimatum game. Um, I think many people have assumed that it's, as you say, many people have assumed that it's anger. Um, you know, one of the things that um, is worth thinking about. And I, I talk about this a little bit in a paper on moral disgust called foul behavior, um, which is to think about different types of moral violations and the different kinds of emotional responses that are instrumentally most valuable in responding to these values. So if you, know, if you think that someone is attacking you or betrays you, then maybe anger is necessary because you've got to like stop them and you've got to recruit people to punish them, you've got to end the relationship. But there are other kinds of moral violations where, you know, the best thing to do is just like, see, uh, take off and like stop interacting with them. And then like emotions like disgust, annoyance, sadness are like instrumentally more valuable. So yeah, do you think that it's, do you think that that's a good, have you thought about that framework for thinking about how maybe different kinds of moral violations are? associated with different emotions. Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting. You're, you're suggesting that we should bifurcate the space 
on sort of an avoid or repetitive domains, right? In some ways. So um, thinking about some of the fear literature, you know, which says get out of there, you know, which is even though fear operates somewhere in the same close quadrant space as anger, it has a very different outcome behaviorally compared to anger, which is to approach and engage. Um, yeah, I mean, like one of the problems I, this won't be a direct answer to your question, but one of the problems that I have with the economic games, I like them in a lot of ways because they bring a precision to the social domain. You know, you can say exactly how much in monetary terms people care about something. Um, and you can set up all these like interesting tensions that are meant to reflect um, certain things that are that we see outside in the world. And for all those reasons, I really like these little test beds. One of the reasons I really don't like these test beds is because of the choice space that it requires. So, I mean, this is the other side of having this the precision and making it so that we can exactly see, you know, what how much people value something is that like if you give people a choice to either accept or reject an offer in the ultimatum game, the, the likelihood of that happening out in the world and the realities that it's actually um, embodying for what happens when we go out and handle and deal with other people is so far fetched, right? So like if we're trying, if we've had like a social, I mean, some of my other work shows this, but if we're confronted with a social norm violation, if someone does something wrong, that's morally wrong, the choice is not to be like, oh, I accept that for what it is versus, oh, I'm going to punish them. There's all sorts of different responses that you can do. Um, and that's not captured in these games. And that would be a more interesting place to test the, the, the question that you just asked is how do you carve, you know, emotion at its joints when it comes to um, thinking about the different types of choices that we're confronted with, but we have to have more complex games or scenarios in which we can look at how these different emotions map onto it, not just make it a, you know, um, an accept as it is, like a, you know, two choice, two first choice, accept as it is, or punish. Um, so I love that question, and I don't have a good answer other to say that we have to be more sophisticated in answering it moving forward. Is there time for another question? Um. Maybe one quick question. Okay, yeah. I, I wanted to ask a little bit about the how um, the valence prediction errors were um, more likely to predict whether someone would reject rather than um, the other prediction. I'm just like wondering why that is. I mean, like I see that the data says that, but like, is there some explanation for why valence prediction errors matter more than arousal prediction errors? Um, at what level of analysis do you want to answer? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I guess kind of like the ecological computational, like what, how does it serve the organism? Okay, perfect. I'll tell you. This is my, this is, we're trying to, we're following up with a lot of um, studies right now to try to answer this question, but here's my hypothesis and then check in with me in a year or two to find out if I'm right. Um, Here's what I think. I think reward is a terrible proxy for what happens out in the world. I think that we might care about money or juice if we're an animal or cake if we're hungry or whatever, like all those things that are rewarding that we test in the lab. Um, those are called like external reinforcers and we use them to make it a reward prediction error. Um, but the truth is, is that we have to take those external rewards and we have to translate them into an internal signal that the body and the brain care brain mostly cares about. Um, so what is that? And I think emotion prediction errors is a better proxy for understanding what value is than these external re uh, reward reinfor reinforcers. Now, that's not to say that the money and the juice and the cake and all that jazz won't have some predictive value because it will, but that if we're going to really think about what the signal that the brain cares about and how it's constructing the value, it's going to be on emotion. That's my guess. Thanks. Well, this has been a fascinating discussion. Um, I know we have to we have to wrap it up, but I think it's it's been interesting to just to think about more generally as we think about like moral learning, social learning, trying to you know integrate the the focus on emotion prediction errors um, from the first talk, but then also the the relational context in which these interactions are embedded. I think is also quite fascinating to consider, and so it. it Hopefully, 
you, you all found something interesting from this and can useful for thinking about how we learn and change moral attitudes. Thank you both, both speakers for uh, joining us. And there's one more panel a week from today. Uh, stick, stick around for that one next week if you're interested. But thanks again for your time. And thank you, Daryl, and also Victor for an amazingly interesting talk and really stretching how my mind thinks about stuff and also your great questions. This was really fun. So thank you both. Thank you. I really, really enjoyed it. Thanks, Daryl. Thanks, Ariel. Thanks. See you all later. Bye. Bye.